Hi, I'm Keith Nolan. Welcome to Access All Areas. And I'm here today in Bangkok with legendary writer Jerry Hopkins. Thank you. Good to be here. Nice to see you. You started out with the Rolling Stone magazine writing. Let, uh, tell us about your first biography. Well, uh, I had been with Rolling Stone for two and a half, three years, and one of the things I did during that period was do a Rolling Stone interview with Jim yep. Morrison. I had been drinking in the same bars with him. We, we were not friends, but we were more than acquaintances. And uh, uh, during the course of my interview with him, he suggested uh, that I write a bu book about Elvis. It had never occurred to me. I was not an Elvis fan when he first came out in the 50s. Um, but I thought about it and I realized that Elvis had been forgotten and that it, he represented an amazing earth shift, both socially, culturally, musically, I mean, almost any way you could think. And um, I also felt that he had been sort of misrepresented or misunderstood in the sense that um, what he, the image he projected to the public was not who he was really inside. You know, he was during the 1950s regarded as a threat worse than communism. Uh, the, the ministers, you know, blacklisted him. Uh, rock and roll was considered a threat. When at the time he was really a God-fearing, church-going, yes sir, no sir, mom-loving southern boy, boy. Yeah. well-mannered. Um, Later, he became uh, very mainstream. He crossed, crossed over and became the J.C.'s Young Man of the Year. Mm -hmm. The highway that ran past Graceland was named for him. Mm -hmm. uh, he became kind of mainstream, by which time he was getting into drugs and guns and girls and, and all the rest of it. I mean, he, he was always sort Hanks. of not what you saw. And that, that, I found, was very true of a lot of rock stars. Jim Morrison said a, a, a book about Elvis is something he'd like to read, and that's what ins inspired the book in the first place. I, I was interviewing Jim for Rolling Stone, and I had just published a small history of, of rock and roll, and he said he'd read it and liked it, and was I writing another book? And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about doing a biography. It intrigues me as a form, and I was actually thinking about Frank Zappa, because I'd known Zappa from when, before he was a rock star. And uh, Jim just said simply, I'd like to read a book about Elvis. Hmm. And uh, when he'd said that, we had just come from his agent's office, which I discovered was my agent as well. And so when I got together a little presentation for the Elvis book, I sent it, you know, gave it to my agent. She sent it to Jim's publisher. Jim had gone to the agent to sign a contract for his, po for his poetry book. And uh, that editor, Simon & Schuster, took the Elvis book. And then yeah. when Jim died in 1971, several years later, um, the, pub the, eight, the publisher called me and he said, how would you like to do a book about Jim? And I said, I've already decided to do one because not only was I affected more greatly by his death than my relationship warranted, mm -hmm. as was the same thing with Elvis, he was, you know, the, the Doors and Morrison, you know, I mean, they went, they were going to go down in history in flames. Morrison was this, this jerk who, you know, dropped his pants or didn't in Miami who, you know, I mean, but oh, no. he, he was a revolutionary too. And he and the Doors changed music and changed the way a lot of people look at things and became an icon along with Elvis. So I, and Jim Morrison was also a poet. He considered himself a poet. He considered himself a filmmaker. Uh, he had a sense of humor about himself. He was extraordinarily intelligent. He could talk about anything. He'd read everything and remembered it all and put it together in interesting ways. He, you know, he was not, you know, the way he was portrayed in that movie by Oliver Stone. He, there was more to him. Yeah. And I just feel that, you know, rock and roll was not getting any kind of attention in those days of a serious nature. Jerry, tell me about your meeting with Jimi Hendrix. That was quite an unusual meeting. I'd seen Jimi Hendrix in performance a couple of times, but I'd never met him. And um, one day I'm 
while I was living in Los Angeles, my wife came home from wherever she was shopping, and she said she had run into this guy uh, who put the moves on her, you know, <laughs> wanted to like, you know, mm -hmm. and asked her, would you like to meet Jimi Hendrix? What a lie. And, and, and she said, why? And he said, well, he's a friend of mine, and he's in town, he's in Beverly Hills, and I'm going to go over to his room, and, and would you like to come along? And she said, yes, can my husband come too? He writes for <laughs> Rolling Stone. Well, the guy was cool enough to, you know, yeah. say, cool, you know, yeah. yeah. So we went to the hotel, and Jimmy um, explained that he had a friend coming who he'd been friends with in the Army, who was a bass player, and that he was abandoning, he was giving up, he was ending the trio. Oh. And he was going to go into a new kind of music, so I got a, I got a story out of it as well. And uh, it's going to be called Sky Music, and you know, it became different personnel, different kind of music and so on. Anyway, at the end of the little interview, he said, you know, you know, my bass player and I are just going to jam for a little while. If you'd like to hang around, please feel free to do so. Well, of course, you know, private yeah. concert for, from Jimi Hendrix, you know, I mean, there was nobody else there in the room. And a, Except the guy that let you watch. You know, and a, I left my, my tape recorder running, and of course, it, the batteries died, and I have no, no record of that. That would have been uh, a nice uh, recording to have. <laughs> so, Jerry Hopkins, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Jerry. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure.